For this lesson we're going to be looking at the derivative of the tangent function. Unlike previous lessons I'm not actually going to show a GeoGebra demo for this one. We're actually going to come up with this by making use of our definitions for derivatives of sine and cosine. So just to recall what we've looked at before, the derivative of sine x is equal to cosine x and the derivative of cosine x is equal to the negative sine of x. And just a reminder, this notation that I'm showing you here, d by dx of something, this is known as implicit differentiation. We don't really do much of that in this course, but it's actually a really handy notation. It saves us having to write out y equals sine x, which means y prime is equal to cos x. We're just saying the derivative of this thing is equal to this new thing. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is to take the derivative of tan x, I'm actually going to say that d by dx of tan x is the derivative, d by dx, of, but instead of tan x, I'm going to write that as sine x over cosine of x. And so now when I take the derivative of this, I take the derivative using the quotient rule. So I'm going to take the derivative of the numerator, which is cosine of x, multiplied by the denominator, which is still cos x, minus the numerator, which is sine x, times the derivative of the no de de denominator, which is negative sine x, and that's going to be over the denominator squared, which is cosine squared of x. And so this numerator becomes cosine squared of x, and I've got a negative and a negative here, which means that becomes a positive sine squared of x, all divided by cosine squared of x. And then I'll ask you to recall your Pythagorean identity from trig identities, which says that sine squared of x plus cos squared of x is equal to 1. And other than the ordering of these terms, that's what we have here. So I end up with 1 over cosine squared of x, which we can, again, we can use another identity, which is the reciprocal identity, and we can write this in its final form, which is secant squared of x. So it turns out that the derivative of tan of x is secant squared of x. So if we start from there, then if we're in a situation where we have to apply the chain rule, so you can see I'm doing that now in this alternate form. I put it in the form y equals. So if y is equal to this, then dy by dx, which is another way of saying y prime of x, that's going to be equal to secant squared of the argument. So tan of g of x, tan of an argument, the derivative is the secant squared of the argument, but then we also have to multiply by the derivative of the argument. So this is an application of the chain rule that has actually been a real focus of this entire chapter as we've explored these different functions and taken their derivatives. So let's work through some examples just so we can see that happening. We'll start with something fairly simple and we'll move on to increasing levels of complexity here. So on this page I should be able to fit a and b. So for a I'm going to take f prime of x and so we know that we've got the tangent of an argument and this argument is not just x so I'm going to have to use the chain rule. So the derivative of tangent is equal to the secant squared of the argument so that's the secant squared of 4x but I also have to multiply by the chain rule tells me I have to take the derivative of this argument and the derivative of that argument is just equal to 4. So I end up with my simplified answer is 4 secant squared of 4x. For part b, I think I'll do part b down here, for part b we have f of x is equal to sine x tan x. Now you could actually choose to change tangent into sine over cos here if you wanted to, but I'm going to do this using the rule that we just developed in this lesson. I'm going to use an alternate form instead of saying f prime of x, just to show you there's different ways to do this. We also sometimes call that df by dx, so the, the derivative of f with respect to x. 
And so that's going to be the derivative of the first, which is cosine of x times the second, which is tan of x, plus the first, which is sine of x, times the derivative of the second, which is secant squared of x. Now at this point, you actually have a bunch of options. How do you choose to write this out? So in this case, I don't see anything that's really obvious as far as a good way to write this. Um, there's a few ways that we could write this. For example, one option, I'll just say here's option number one, we could change this tan, so we could write this as cos x, and then we could rewrite this one as sin x over cos x, plus sin x No, I had it written before. I was going to make a fraction. Sine x and then secant x can be rewritten as the fraction 1 over cos squared x. So we end up with something like that. And you can see here, this is going to divide out with this one. And remember, whenever you divide something out like this, you you'd have to keep track of you don't always have to write it out, I'm just doing it here. So when I get rid of that, we need to remember that cosine x is not equal to 0. But that restriction is here. It's already there. And then we could simplify this further. Another option, so I'll put down here 2. Another thing we could have done here is we could have, let's see, leave this in terms of tangent. And then actually you can see here I've got a sine x over cos x. And so let's keep the cos x tan x and let's take this sine x sec squared x which is this piece but that sine over cos is actually another tan x and that would leave me with a 1 over cos which is a, a same as a secant. Now why would I do this? What value is this one? Well this one has value because now I have a common factor of tan x and I've got cos x plus secant x left over. I just made up this example. It doesn't have any particular meaning to me other than to show you taking derivatives. So similarly, I don't have a particular destination in mind for my answer. But using your various trig identity relationships, even if they're simple trig identity relationships like the definition of tan, you can still write these in different forms, which means your answers may appear in different forms. They might not match those of your classmates or of the solution set you're looking at, or of the textbook. Let's take a look at a couple of more difficult ones. I'm not going to take them very far. The, the point of this is to really work on that first step when we're taking the derivative. So for part c, we've got y equals tan squared of the square root of x. So I'm going to write that as y prime. And when I take the derivative of that, I end up with 2 tan, and this 2 would become a 1, which I'm not going to write here, of the square root of x. So that's the outer function part, so that's the power rule. But now I have to apply the chain rule to that, which is where I actually take the derivative of tan of square root of x. And so the derivative of tan of square root of x is equal to the secant squared of the square root of x. But I have another chain that I have to deal with here, which is I've got the square root of x. And so now that's going to be multiplied by the derivative of the square root of x, which is equal to 1 half x to the negative 1 half. Divide out those twos. And now in my numerator, I have, let's see, I've got tan root x secant squared root x, and that's all going to be divided by the square root of x. And although this was certainly not a simple function to start with, or a simple expression to start with, it's gotten much more complicated when we've moved into our first derivative. And for part d, once again I've got a y equals ln, and again we're going to have a chain of a chain here. I'm going to write this one as dy by dx. I'm just kind of throwing different notations at you here. 
So the derivative of the outer function in this case was ln, whereas over here the outer function was something squared. So that's why we did a power rule here. Now our first rule is going to be our rule for derivatives of ln, which is 1 over the argument of the ln, which the argument of ln is this whole thing, tan of x cubed. And now I have to multiply that. According to the chain rule, I have to multiply that by the derivative of the argument. Now the argument of the ln was tan of x cubed. So the derivative of tan of x cubed is secant squared of x cubed. But I have to multiply that by the derivative of the argument of tan. And so the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. And once again, some simplification. There's really not much more I'm going to do here. I'm not going to apply any trig identities. And so I end up in the numerator with 3x squared secant squared of x cubed, all divided by the tan of x cubed. And remember, make use of parentheses liberally if you need to in order to help keep things straight. So if you decide that you need to remember that x cubed is the argument of this whole thing, then you can go ahead and do that. If you need a set of parentheses here, that's fine. The one thing I was about to say there, though, is generally you don't want to have to resort to this notation because really you're not going to see that very often. For trigonometry, the typical notation is going to look like that secant squared and the only thing you need to watch out for is if you're trying to do a reciprocal because if we put a secant for example to the minus one of x that's the inverse so if we want the reciprocal we have to write that as secant x all to the negative one that's the reciprocal and so that's an important distinction to make now that we're back into dealing with these trigonometric functions and it's been a while since we've been looking at these things. Okay, that's it, I believe, for this lesson. There's some recommended work for you to get some practice on this idea of the derivative of tan. But of course, now we're at the end of the unit, which means any of the derivative rules that we've developed in this unit can crop up any combination of them. As you saw, chain rules within chain rules within chain rules. So things can get quite complex quite quickly.